Wait, planes? What? You're telling me two passenger aircraft into two different towers, and then a third tower also collapsed. I just don't see it, man. Oh, crap, we're recording. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Uh, Skits on series, episode 21. Topics today is the mouse, getting mouse input. How does that work? Ultimately, not really an engineering topic in my opinion, but it does open the door for us to do many cool things down the road, making type of you know, GUI, also rotating three-dimensional models in space, picking faces, getting you know quantities of interest like that. There are applications for this down the road. So not too much theory, pretty quick. Uh, how do you get mouse input? And this is Linux specific, but it is applicable also to BSD. They do support this. Um, you open and you read this file called dev input mice. And there are other files, event files that you could go into and check as well. But this is the simplest way to do it. So you read three bytes from dev input mice and those bytes encode the mouse status. And for the lowest byte, the lowest three bits of that encode whether or not the left mouse button, the right mouse button and the middle mouse button or the scroll wheel are clicked. The next biggest byte encodes how much we've moved in the polling period of the mouse uh, in the X direction, positive or negative, and then the, the, the third byte is the Y direction. So very simple stuff right there. Then keeping track of things. So how do you track the mouse over time through your program? Well, Helga says she creates some structure to track the mouse position and the click status. And this way she can just add that DX and DY quantity from above over here to the running count of where the mouse position actually is uh, every time that she checks it. And so she has some function here called frame buffer mouse init that creates these data structures. So basically anytime you want to access in your entire program, the mouse position, you can just say frame buffer mouse init dot mouse X, and that would pull out four bytes from this spot of memory, which would encode our pixel location for the mouse cursor in the X direction, same for the Y direction. And then she encodes a single byte, which is to encode whether or not the buttons are depressed on the mouse. So as before, bit zero is left, bit one is right, and bit two is the middle mouse button. And then she checks the mouse status every time the frame buffer is uh, flushed to the screen to see if the mouse has moved if we have to redraw the mouse. And that's done in this frame buffer mouse pull function. And so the overall process that I use to render things to the screen is kind of a little bit, is, is much the you know obvious way to do it. But the thing is the way that's easiest to draw this to the screen is not the best way because what happens is let's say you have some complicated background image that you wanna to show to the screen behind your cursor. Well, let's say it's a picture of your cat or of the, the Twin Towers, um, or had some, let's say had some amount of math that went into it. You did some kind of detailed computation to plot things to the screen. And so you wouldn't wanna to have to redraw that over and over again. What you do is you just draw that to an intermediate buffer. You say that whole background image, the whole desktop, is an intermediate buffer somewhere else in memory that's not the frame buffer. Then you copy that intermediate buffer to the frame buffer. So now the frame buffer does include that information. And then you put the cursor on top of that. So you haven't affected your original data. You've you've made a copy of the data in the frame buffer that you've then put the cursor on top of. So now you're not constantly overwriting your nice, beautiful background image with the cursor drawing. It's just more efficient this way. Then you then flush the frame buffer to the screen and then you wait for updates either to the background or to the mouse. If you get an update to those two things, one of the two, you can then redo this entire process. So yeah, that's the entire theory there, uh, really detailed, really advanced stuff. Um, so let's get into the examples. I have one example that just shows the basics of reading the mouse device, those three bytes from that file. Then I have one that shows those two functions to init and pull the mouse status. I have one that we're drawing a cursor. Actually, that's the one I just showed you in the beginning of this video where we were actually drawing on the screen. And then I have one that shows how you can use the mouse to rotate a 3D model using pitch and yaw. So we'll do that really quick. Not too much to discuss today, a very simple topic. So let's show you first 
Again, I'm going back and forth between the VM and real life, so give me a second here. Oh, one, one more thing. In order to read the mouse device, you have to have permission. So you have to run this as a, a user with permission to do so. So sudo works for that purpose. Um, so you can see here, uh, this example, which I'll show you the code for in a second, example A just tracks how much the mouse has been moving up and down, left and right, and so you can see it's plotting dx and dy. And if I click, you can see it's tracking all those different types of clicks, left click, middle click, and right click. So how does this work? Let me show you a little bit bigger. So, What do we have in this example? So first, it's very simple. We have three different includes. So we have an include for opening a file, that file being the mouse file. Then I have a, I have two functions to print. So just printing characters and printing ints. So how does this work? First thing you can see, I'm opening a file with read permissions. So how do we do this? Well, what is the file name? Let's check down here. File name is dev input mice and it's null terminated because you have to have that for Linux to know what you're doing, talking about. Then what I do is I am reading four bytes with a sysread syscall from that file descriptor to a buffer location that is four bytes in length. Then I'm just looking through and seeing, well, I'm first testing, have I got any bytes out? Because if I haven't got any bytes, so these syscalls return number of bytes that you read. And if the answer is zero, then don't waste your time with any logic because there's nothing that you read. And so in the case where you have read something, you would then parse. So I'd say, well, I'm parsing the lowest lowest byte here. Let me show you from that depiction. So the lowest byte, the lowest three bits of that are valuable information. And so if you think about the binary or the hex value for this, it would be uh, seven to mask off just these three bits, right? One plus two plus four. And so that's what's happening in uh, in this instruction here. We're taking just the lowest three bits and we're evaluating if you know it's one, we've left clicked. If it's two, we've right clicked. If it's four, we've middle clicked. And then we've just plotted out all that stuff. And then on the case where, you know, we have a mouse input, we can also then check for the other two bytes. So the other two bytes were the DX and the DY. And so as you would expect, that's all we're doing. We're just shifting the, the buffer by eight bits, max, masking off everything else, um, making it assigned value because it's assigned value and then printing it to the screen. And so that's what you were seeing here. When I move the mouse left, right, up and down, we're tracking DX and DY. And when I click, you can see that the mouse clicks are also being tracked. Okay, great. Example B. So let's show how that works first. Again, I have to do sudo. So yeah, what's happening here is nothing. Let me show you. So if I click, you can see it's I'm left clicking now, you can see it's tracking the current mouse position and putting a dot wherever the mouse currently is while I'm holding the left click. When I release left click, it's not holding anything to the screen. Now, middle click, different color, right click, different color. So this is kind of just goes to show that you can, you can apply different things to the screen based off the mouse status. So here we're taking the mouse X, the mouse Y, and the mouse click status, left, right, and middle, to draw to the screen. Um, let's show how that works in the assembly code. So this time I have a little bit more going on. Obviously we have we have all that mouse stuff, right, required, but also the frame buffer stuff. So if you call from episode 20, we had all this stuff about the heap and the frame buffer being initialized to draw to the screen. And then we have this function down here, set pixel, which is gonna draw those dots to the screen wherever the mouse happens to be located. So, yep, 
as you would expect, we initialize things in episode 20. The same thing goes here. We create our heap, our frame buffer, and our mouse. Then we are, first off, making the screen entirely black. And I've defined three different colors here for the different clicks. Um, and uh, then I have a rendering loop where I basically just check, have we, has the mouse status changed? So I'm comparing the mouse state byte. Um, and if it's non-zero, we have something. If not, we just continue to, to do this check over and over again. If we do have a mouse change, we can then do a conditional move of the right color. So we define the colors in R13, 14, and 15 for the different clicks. Conditional move instruction lets you conditionally move a value from one location to another under some conditions. Here are the conditions. Uh, and then you can see I'm just plotting, in this case, a four pixels, not just one, to make it easier to see. So I have uh, four set pixel calls, which just draw those orange or blue or red dots to the screen. So that's how that works, a very simple process, pretty cool. And then it also does show the same uh, functions that Helga was discussing in these slides. Now, what about example three? This is the example I was showing you in the beginning of the video. So in this case, a couple things are going on. First, let me just see what you can see. So first, you note that I have a cursor that's not ghosting on the screen. I'm not getting a, a track of those orange and blue and red dots like you were in the previous example. Because in that example, we were just drawing directly to the frame buffer. We're putting our pixels directly on the frame buffer, no intermediate buffers whatsoever. In this case, you can see the cursor, which by the way is Pepe the Frog. He is potted on top of the frame buffer. And so I can draw things to the screen and he can go over the top of them and not affect the innate status of that background bitmap. And so how does that work? Well, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Let me show you in our little process here. Basically, again, we have that background being drawn to a separate buffer then copying that separate buffer to the frame buffer and then potting the cursor on top of that. So that should be pretty straightforward. I'll show you how it works in the code right now. Here, there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> a lot of uh, memory things, heap stuff, all the functions from before and, uh, and also a few others, for example, in the previous example, I was just drawing dots to the screen. In this case, I want all the dots to be connected, kind of like you'd have in MS Paint, you know, when you're drawing with the, the cursor. And so I have lines being drawn between the points after I've clicked. So, yep, how does this work? Again, much the same stuff. First thing we do is we clear the screen, then we copy that black screen to our intermediate buffer. That's our base desktop background, I guess you could call it. Then I keep track of the old cursor location so I can draw the lines right where I need to. And then I have a rendering loop. In this loop, it's a little more complicated because there's checks for whether or not you've depressed a button. And so here, um, oh, I should also mention in that example, the right click clears the screen. So I can draw stuff, right click clears the screen. I didn't mention that before. So here we do, we, we, we check if we click the right, the right button, we clear the screen. If not, we go on with the, the loop. Then if it's left clicked, we then draw an orange pixel and align to the screen. If you care to see the logic, you take the logic out yourself. And then when it comes down to Pepe the Frog, um, he is then drawn at the very end. So I have a location of memory, actually it's down here, where I have literally defined colors for Pepe the Frog. I have uh, green, white, black, transparent, the shirt color, and then red for his lips. And I have two Pepe's, I have a big one and a small one, and I can show you how they would work. Also, I have a regular orange square cursor you can check out if you'd want. Um, you can change these values in here. Let's do it. Let's make Pepe smaller. So Pepe small. Oh, I can't actually show you on this one because it's not on the VM. Let's do it in the VM. So complicated. I don't have Vim. All right, dude, calling it off. Calling it off, guys. I'm not using Nano. 
Um, so yeah, that's how that works. We have basically just drawing the cursor on top of the frame buffer. And that uses this function that I created called set foreground. Basically that lets you have the different layers and transparency and stuff. You can draw things on top of other bitmaps. So pretty useful function there. And lastly, we had an example for the 3D cube model. Let's check out that one. Oh my God, D. Before I show you the code, let's show you the actual example running. And so you can see here with Pepe, I can, you know, uh, pitch and yaw the cube around. I don't particularly like pitch and yaw as ways to control the the view orientation. We'll do something different in the future. It's just a very simple example to show that you can use the mouse to affect some mathematics that you then render to the screen, which is what's happening in this example here. So cool stuff. Um, I'll show you the code really quick so you can see what's going on. Again, we will actually do much more sophisticated rendering than what you just saw, but that will come in a future video. How does this work? Well, a lot of includes in this one, a lot of math in this one. Um, so basically this is a combination of everything you saw in the previous, previous episode, episode 20 and today. So we have all the functions for the frame buffer, all the functions for drawing pixels of the screen and lines, functions for rasterizing things, functions for doing trigonometry and matrix multiplication. Cause again, we're, we were getting things in space that involves a rotation matrix. So, um, it's kind of like the amalgamation of episode 20 and episode 21. And you can see here, we are basically rasterizing the original cube to the screen in the base case. And we have a rendering loop. You can see here where <laughs> kind of we're checking if the left click is pressed. If it is, now we have to track how the cube is moving. And so we are calculating how much we've moved down here. So, um, where does that happen? Let me see. Oh yeah, here we can see whether or not we've whether or not we have moved. If so, uh, draw to the screen. If not, we're just clicking for the first time. First, we check the background and clear it out. Then we compute the motion in the x and y direction to compute how much yaw and pitch we have. Then we calculate the cosine and sine of that yaw and pitch angle. We use that to construct the rotation matrix, which is a three by three matrix that encodes basically a two rotations together. Um, I want to explain that in this video. We'll talk about that later. Um, then again, we kind of like in the previous video where we were just were orbiting the cube, we can have to perpendicularize our up direction against our looking direction. And then we rasterize that cube on that projected plane and draw it to the screen. Um, and then lastly, we draw Pepe the Frog on top of that. And so going back to the example, you can see here, let me uh, close out and redo it. See, we start off with a cube in some orientation, and then if I move the cursor, you can see that the orientation changes while I'm holding the mouse button. If I let go, I can move the cursor around without moving the cube. So this is kind of how you would interact with the CAD software, a very primitive uh, CAD viewing software. With that out of the way, that's the entire topic. Pretty simple stuff. Just wanna talk about how we could get mouse input for purposes that we're going to be doing down the road. Maybe a GUI, maybe different types of fun programs, maybe some more 3D rendering type stuff down the road. If that interests you, check out the videos in the future and check out the Discord link in the description. I'll see you around.